the Eora Nation, the traditional custodians of this land, and I pay my respects to Elders, both past and present as well. Um, yes, my name is Rhonda Unitsis, and I work in the comms team. I'm very fortunate too at the Centre for Social Impact. And as Nick mentioned, some of you may have seen me facilitating on the other side of these webinars. But as with my job, I tell a lot of stories through my work um, and I showcase the people that we're connected with. So today I have the pleasure of doing that same role um, in my interview today with our special guest, Tom Dawkins. Tom is the co-founder and CEO of Start Some Good, and he's also a board member with the Centre for Social Impact. Tom has had so many achievements over his career, which have taken him to many parts of the world and in many different capacities. And we'll get to some of those a little later. Um, but for now, I'd like to welcome Tom to Impact 2020. Great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, and let me just uh, acknowledge before we begin that I am joining you from Camaragal country, part of the Eora Nation, which is the North Shore of Sydney, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging here and everywhere else around our nation and world as well. Thanks, Tom. Um, so how have you been in this challenging time? Like, what's been happening for you? Yeah, it has been kind of a crazy time for us. So, I mean, a lot of what Start Some Good does is driven by partnerships um, with, with kind of organisations across the sector who we work with to kind of help them more effectively support grassroots innovation. And so most of our partnership programs came to a screeching halt as those organisations, you know, paused and, and reconsidered and then freaked out a little bit. And certainly that had a uh, could have had a really disastrous impact on us. We were very fortunate that we we also have a number of programs that are delivered online. Um, so we were in a position to kind of focus in on what what, what could continue. Um, and a, a big focus for us has been our online summit um, that we're running as we speak. We're about halfway through. It kicked off on Monday and it runs from May 11 to 20, the starting good, hashtag starting good virtual summit. And we're hoping for about 10,000 participants this year. So that that's kind of, that's, that's blowing up. That's been kind of exciting to see what was kind of a novel, uh, kind of niche concept a year ago, a virtual yeah. summit for people who are interested in social entrepreneurship. Suddenly the market of people who are at least willing to check out a virtual summit is maybe not quite everyone, but, but seeming close to everyone is at least giving it a go or dipping their, their toe in the water because that's all we have right now. Um, so it's been exciting. Some things have been kind of full steam ahead and if, if anything kind of growing um, in the face of the, the current situation, other things are, uh, on hold and uncertain and, and we're hoping to get them unpaused in the coming months. Mm. Well, I appreciate you joining me today because I know what it's like organizing now. I know what it's like organizing a summit. So um, I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure. I mean, you know, I'm just on, <laughs> on Zoom all the time, basically. So this is <laughs> totally part of the flow. <laughs> so can you tell us a bit more, like I want to get into your background and how you got to where you are, but at first I want to start with the now. Mm -hmm. So, um, for those that don't know, can you tell us what Start Some Good is and what your role is? I'm int really interested in that as a CEO um, of your organisation and also what your team's um, roles are and where they are in the world. Yeah, so our, our team kind of fluctuates a bit over time depending on what we have on and what we've got going. We've got a bunch of people um, involved in the summit right now. Our core team, though, is uh, probably about seven of us as a, as a, as a stable core and we're in... Um, we're in seven different locations. Um, so we, we, we were already remote. You know, my, my co-founder and I never lived in the same city. Well, that's not true. We, we did live in the same city when I worked in, in Washington, D.C., but I'd already moved to San Francisco by the time we got talking about the thing that would become Start Some Good. Mm -hmm. So we were kind of born virtual in that respect. So it's not as, you know, not as much of an impact on, I guess, how we work with each other. We, we kind of would say in the early part of this, you know, this is what we've trained for. <laughs> we're so like, we're so ready for this world. We never see each other anyway. Um, you know, so it's, uh, well, I miss the kind of the co-working space I used to spend time in and, and the, the, you know, the sense of community and, and seeing people there, it, it hasn't changed my, my, you know, relation, my working relationship with my colleagues at all, uh, really. So Start Some Good is a social innovation, um, catalyst and it, essentially we're an ecosystem builder. We're trying to fill the gap for, you know, uh, so our, our purpose is to increase the pace of innovation for social change and the way we do that is by trying to empower and invest in grassroots innovators. So people with a lived experience of, of social challenge, people with new ideas, people who are not part, necessarily part of the current system or organizations who are looking to try new things and, and invent new approaches to change. We, we started off focused purely on the funding gap for, for social innovation. And so it began life as a crowdfunding platform. But since then we've really evolved into more of an educational 
um, organization or, or a capacity builder. The majority of what we do now is run accelerators, capacity building programs, social enterprise design courses. Um, and a lot of that leads into people testing and launching their ideas through crowdfunding, although not necessarily. And so we run those programs, um, as I said, most almost entirely in partnership with, with various organizations. So we, we run the Future Makers program for Optus, the Dream Starter program for ING. Uh, we've done Picture of the Parramatta with the City of Parramatta the last four years. We've also done Picture of the Good programs with the cities of Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth. We've been doing work um, with uh, entrepreneurs in the Pacific Islands over the last six months with the United Nations Development Program, which is kind of adapting and continuing now to help help with projects that are, are you know that are responding to the challenge of, of COVID at the moment. Um, and and then we have things like you know the summit, which is kind of about you know helping open people's uh, minds around what's possible, be inspired by examples and new and you know emerging models of change, and to try and inspire more people, I guess, to to get started. So kind of, if you look at our, our public ecosystem now, we've got the summit is in, for inspiration, is to help people get started, to help people kind of, you know, build the personal courage and the motivation, I think, to, to, to jump in, um, as well as, you know, those of us who are already on the journey to, to access, you know, inspiring stories and, and new ideas and new insights that will help us along the way. Then we've got uh, Good Hustle, which is our social enterprise design course. And so that's a, a 10 week cohort based online program that helps people create launch or growth ready social enterprise ideas um so that's you know uh, inspiration design and then start some good is for launching and testing generally and what and the the next piece that we're currently working at the moment is a crowd lending platform which would be for growth which would be for more proven models ready to actually who need to raise additional growth capital to invest and expand and increase their impact and but then our real business is all is kind of how we customize white label and adapt those core mm -hmm. the, those kind of core assets um, on behalf of our partners so often then white labeling them into a program like Dream Starter, which essentially uses kind of part of some of our kind of coaching and capacity building methodology then leads into a, a, fundra a match fundraising opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's us um, at the mm -hmm. moment. So it's, it's, been, it's been a real journey, you know, we began, we began aspiring to the kickstart of a social change, but we've kind of obviously ended up in a very different place. While we still have that crowdfunding platform, it's, it's only a small fraction of our own overall revenue or, or, or our overall focus now. Wow. Um, and it's partly because we realize that people need more than just the tools. I guess, you know, a crowdfunding platform is a great set of tools to share stories and raise money, but it presupposes that people know the story they need, they want to tell, who they want to tell that story to, and how best to leverage those tools. And so I guess our focus now is, is how do we teach people? You know, how, how do we help people kind of articulate their stories and visions for change? How do we help them think about who, who are the right people to tell that story to? Because of mm. course, from a fundraising community building point of view, a story is only good, only as good as your ability to match it with the right listeners. There's no perfect story in a vacuum. There's just the right story for that audience. Um, and then how do we provide the tools so they can actually go and do that? Mm, okay. So Nick has been um, adding the URLs for the summit and your um, main website into the chat box. Brilliant. Um, so people go and check that out. Um, I'm interested to, it's so good to see Dream Starter still going strong because I remember when I was at school for social entrepreneurs and mm -hmm. uh, we partnered on it. Um, SSE is no longer, unfortunately, but um, that was sort of in the early days with Sally. So it's good to see. That's right. Uh, kicking on <laughs> in some ways dream started is kind of what changed us i think as a company because it never would have occurred to us that like it just wasn't just wasn't how we were thinking that we could kind of like be a service provider to a company like ing that we could that we could deliver a program on their behalf that we could kind of find i guess third parties to fund the investment and the mm -hmm. effort in, in skilling up and coaching up entrepreneurs none of that had occurred to us we just thought that we had to kind of in in some ways our original kind of focus was the opposite we thought the kind of the sector was a bit hopeless at identifying and investing in innovation. And so our mission was to help entrepreneurs kind of go around them. How do you, uh, how, okay. how, how, how do you, how do you launch, how do you build your own community of supporters and not have to worry about foundations, government, corporates. Yeah. And so it was a little bit of a surprise to discover that now actually the majority of what we do is with foundations and government. <laughs> and, corporate. and it was dream side of the set us on that, on that path. Okay. It was, it was cause they came to us or their ad agency and, and to SSE, cause, you yeah. know, and they had like, I think they went to SSE first, in fact, and I believe SSE said, you should talk to start some good about this. Have and that's fun. what, yeah, and that's what led to the, the Dream Starter Got partnership, it. which we've been running for seven years now. And in some ways, that's what's yeah. led to almost everything else, because that's kind of opened us up to the possibility uh -huh. of partnering. Do you um, want to just explain briefly what, for those that don't know what Dream Starter yeah. is? 
So DreamStart is, dare I say it, Australia's most effective go-to-market program for, for emerging social enterprises, and specifically B2C social enterprises, so social enterprises that have consumer-focused products across all sorts. We've had fashion and food and cleaning products and, uh, you know, sporting goods and all sorts of things, but all of them with a really strong, you know, social impact model embedded within them, either through the greater sustainability of the product or the employment it creates or the redistribution of the profits generated towards important causes. Um, and so ING funds that program. With them, we select, you know, normally, you know, kind of six to 10 uh, social enterprises per round. Um, we then spend about five weeks with them, helping them really kind of clarify their story and, and build their crowdfunding campaign. So they then launch crowdfunding campaigns to match the investment that ING has put into them. And what's interesting about that, that kind of, I think, program design is it's a way of investing in social enterprises that still keeps them really oriented on the market. Because while ING is prepared to fund the capacity building work, and then ING are prepared to put money in directly, it's conditional on them matching those funds from the community. And in so doing, in some ways, prove to ING that they really are worth it, that it's not just, they haven't just managed to kind of talk ING into it, that they do in fact have a community of people who want what they're offering. And I think kind of the danger of a lot of social, you know, we're in an interesting phase in the social enterprise sector, I think, where there's a lot of organisations who are excited about it and want to support it. And so we see quite a lot of social enterprise programs now, but that's created this funny kind of world where, where you can be a very successful social enterprise without ever actually being a successful enterprise by simply being very good at, at gaining support from people yeah. who want to support social enterprises and going from one program to another, winning pitch competitions, winning innovation challenges, and essentially being rewarded for having a great inspiring vision, but mm, not necessarily kind of for having a robot and a good brand and what have you, but not necessarily a product or service that, that people want to pay for, mm. which is ultimately what, what, what a successful enterprise has to have. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of, and, and so it is a challenge to get that right. And I think DreamStart is a really unique model. We're trying to make it less unique because we think this is a really good way to do it because it's a way of ING putting funds in, but saying, but don't get distracted. Don't mm -hmm. think that it's all about talking us into being inspired by your, your vision. You have to get out there and prove that the market actually wants what you're offering. And if you can prove that, we'll double it up. We'll, we'll match it. Mm. We'll, we'll, back, we'll back you as well. But it's not enough to talk us into it. Yeah, because because that that orient setting because that's a that's kind of a set of incentives that is in some ways and no disrespect for this you know I think the not for profit work uh, world does really important work I'm not a social enterprise kind of zealot or <laughs> or, or purist um, but it is creating a not -for you know a structure that rewards people for essentially not for profit not not for profit skills it's it's the same sort of kind of um, incentives as in the not for profit sector like important like important cause great vision kind of charismatic powerful expression. Mm -hmm. of that vision all of that's wonderful but to ultimately succeed as a social enterprise you need customers <laughs> to get customers you need a product or service that delivers value not just to the world but to your customer and it's aligning those two things that ultimately makes for a good social enterprise and i think a lot of programs actually draw people subtly away from that mm -hmm. um, whereas dream starter i think keeps them very oriented on that we're going to help you do this but the the thing that we're helping you do is take a product or service to market and build a community of early adopter customers who want what you're offering. Amazing. Um, yeah, I'm so happy to see it going so well. Um, okay, so now I want to get to Tom, you. <laughs> so I was obviously preparing for this interview and I came across um, a story that you told in one of your presentations. So I'd love um, to get into that a little bit more. So it was when you were a teenager, because I want to kind of go back to the earlier days, <laughs> not back too to many years ago. <laughs> um, maybe like a little bit past childhood, but into the teenage years. And so things weren't going so well for you, didn't have much of a direction or purpose, um, yeah. probably a little bit different to who you are now. Um, and you were telling this story about you were standing in like the corridor. So I'd love you to tell that story to everyone. Yeah, yeah, I know it's exactly really the one you mean. <laughs> this, is, this is the real sliding door moment in my yeah. life. And it's, it's not to say that, you know, I, I like to imagine that I would have ended up in the same place eventually, you know, found my sense of purpose through another set of steps. Um, but yeah, as exactly as, as I said, I was, you know, I was a typical teenager in a lot of ways. I was kind of angry at the world, annoyed with my parents, didn't know how I fit in and didn't know what I wanted to do with myself, didn't understand the point of school because I couldn't see where it was going and didn't have any sense of future direction or ambition that would motivate me to kind of work harder in the present. So I was doing very badly at school and I was, you know, disruptive in general. I was talking, I was not focused. So I got kicked out of English class on this particular day, which was not a particularly uncommon occurrence. And I was skulking around in the corridor. This is year 10. 
Um, I want to say, could have been Minion Night, I think it was you then. Um, and I was skulking around in the corridor, you know, reflecting on the injustice of it all. And so bored um, that I, I, I spotted a, a, a pamphlet that sort of dropped in the corridor and had literally like muddy footsteps on it. But I was so excited just to have something to do, something to read. And I picked it up and it was a, a brochure for a student exchange program. And I, it just blew my mind. I had no idea that that was a thing that was even possible in the world. Like I didn't know that was, mm. I didn't know that existed. But mm. as a teenager, there was a way in which you could just go away. You could just go somewhere else for a while and like leave all of that stuff behind. And I instantly was like, oh my goodness, this is exactly what I need to do. I just, for the first time in my life, I never felt that jolt before. I was like, this is something I need to do. This is for me. And I went home that night and I announced to my parents, I said, mum and dad, I'm going to go to America for a year. <laughs> Um, and as I like to say, they were somewhat suspiciously really enthusiastic about that idea. And <laughs> immediately, they immediately saw the, saw the benefit for everyone in um, me going away for a year. Um, and so it took a year before I could go away for a year and I had to kind of get my act together a little bit. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't go if I was going to continue to come like 179 out of 180 kids um, in, in half my classes. So for the first time I had a like, okay, if I, you know, if I do this, it can lead to this. Um, and I pulled my act together and became you know, an average student, but which was sufficient for my purposes at the time, and, and went to America for a year. Um, and in America, I had another sliding door moment, which is it just so happened that while I was in the US, an event was organized called the State of the World Forum. And this was 1996. Um, and so for those of you who remember that time, that was a time of real uncertainty, not so different in some ways. I mean, different, very different, but not so different maybe from, from how we feel right now, which is that we don't really quite know what the future's gonna hold, because that was immediately after the end of the Cold War. And the Cold War had been the lens through which everything was understood, everything. Um, I mean, I was too young to really be exposed to that, but you know, as I've learned and I've studied history in university in the end, but you, know, you couldn't talk about the environmentalism and climate change without talking about the Cold War. You couldn't talk about trade and fair trade and development without talking about the Cold War. You obviously couldn't talk about war and peace without talking about the Cold War. It was the lens for everything. And then it vanished almost overnight. And no one really knew how to talk about the future anymore. And that led to a whole series of like conferences and third party efforts and conversations that ultimately coalesced through a series of kind of, you know, hap you know haphazard things into the Millennial Development Goals which has now become the Sustainable Development Goals, which is on the wall behind yes, me. Yes, I see that. Very um, cool. Yeah, <laughs> which is, which is, you know, created that focus of what are, what are we trying to do together globally? What's our agenda as a global kind of civilization again? But this is very early on in that. And it, it, the State of the World Forum brought together this kind of, you know, Cold War Hall of Fame kind of get together, meet up with, with Gorbachev and Reagan and Thatcher were all there. Oh. There were multiple Nobel Peace Prize winners. There were business people, environmentalists, spiritualists, like a lot of names I didn't recognize at the time I was 16. And the reason that I was there was that, you know, they decided, as you do, that, you know, gee whiz, if we're talking about the future, wouldn't it be nice to have some young people here? But they didn't have the time, the inclination, the budget to do like a global search for worthy young leaders. So they did what you do when you're, you know, trying to do a lot um, when you're an under-resourced, which is that you partner. Mm -hmm. And so they partnered with AFS, the world's biggest exchange organization, to choose young people who were already conveniently located in America. Right. Uh, now, if they had done a global search, there's just zero chance I, I, I could have been there. A, I never would have heard about it. How did anyone hear about anything in 1996? Yeah. I mean, my, yeah. <laughs> my school was not, my school didn't share those sorts of opportunities because they would distract us from academics and rugby. Right. Um, and so, B, if I had heard about it, there's no way I would have, like, seen myself in that. Like, yeah. I just... That didn't sound like me at all. I, no, I wasn't doing, I hadn't done anything. I had to, like, yeah. didn't deserve to be there. I'd never, I'd never really contributed much apart from rocked up to a few rallies with my parents. Yeah. And see if I had applied, obviously I wouldn't have been selected. There must have been, I always feel a little bit guilty looking back. There would have been way more worthy young Australians. Mm. But there I was in America. And for some reason, someone decided that I should be invited to apply. They chose five Australians to like, write an essay. Why I'd like to know this, they the world for them. I don't even know why I was one of those five. I think maybe I'd been opinionated at the, at the like uh -huh. onboarding session, yeah, you know, that they like, oh, he seems to like at least uh -huh. enjoy discussing this stuff. <laughs> and so I ended up, and so I was selected and I ended up at this event in San Francisco and I literally arrived on the first day and they were like, thank God you're all here. You're here to represent 3.5 billion people under 16. I was oh. like, what? <laughs> this is crazy. Yeah. Um, and then I just had the most extraordinary five days. I just, wow. I, met, I, I met these amazing people, the other young people were from 20, 32 of us from 29 countries all around the world. Um, we had one-on-one, -on -one, well, 32-on-one 
um, meetings with Mikhail Gorbachev, with uh, Rigoberta Menchutam, the Guatemalan Nobel Peace Prize winner. Um, it was drilled into us that, you know, we had a responsibility to represent our peers and to be a voice for young people. And so I came out of that event, you know, and I didn't like, it was a really crazy sensation. I, I stayed up almost all night, every night for five days, just chatting with the others, like a couple of hours sleep a night. I barely ate. I never felt hungry. I skipped right. every meal. I lost, I, I lost something ridiculous, like, you know, four kilograms in five days or something, but I just never felt hungry. The only, the only equivalent experience, I've only had that experience twice in my life, where you're kind of having an emotional experience that is overridden all mm. your normal physiological experiences. And it was then and when I met my now wife. Oh, um, <laughs> and, and I think it was this, I think in some ways it's the same thing. It was this kind of out of control sensation of falling in love with the idea that, that yeah. I could have a purpose, that I had a role to play, that I had a sense of mission for the first time. Mm. But then a funny thing happened when I came out of that. On the one hand, I had, I, like, had this kind of deeply instilled idea that, that I had a role to play that, you know, that I had to kind of contribute, that I had to be involved, that I'd been given this incredible opportunity. Mm. Um, but as I thought more about that opportunity I'd been given, I became more and more worried about how I'd been given it. And mm. I realized that what I'd just experienced is how youth empowerment tends to happen, which is that it's haphazard, it's tokenistic, and it's biased towards wealth. But I just ended up there from some random series of events, not because I was the most deserving person or the voice that needed to be heard. And that every single one of us who were there, while we had this surface diversity, we were boys and girls, we were black and white, and we were developed world and developing world. Every single one of us had parents who could afford to send us to America for a year mm. um, on exchange. And it got me thinking a lot about the benefit that I'd received and how to make that benefit less haphazard, less tokenistic, and less, less just a particular type of young person who is always taking advantage of these types of experiences. And, it's, and I got to thinking about how can we make this as close to a universal experience as possible? How do we let everyone know? Because I think at the heart of empowerment is what I'd experienced was this sense that people wanted to hear what I had to say, that my voice mattered, that even these very important people like presidents and world leaders and Nobel Peace Prize winners had stopped and wanted to hear what the 32 of us, 16 and 17 year olds, had had to say. And I think that's at the heart of empowerment is mm. you can't believe your voice matters if no one is willing to listen. Um, and so what I've literally been doing ever since is trying to find ways to get more people, to give more people that sensation and more people that opportunity to know that their voice matters, to have people willing to listen to them, and then to be able to take collective action together to create the future mm. we want. And so that take, took the form of a student organization in my American high school when I, got, when, when I got back to it. I then founded a student organization that grew to 50 high schools in Sydney when I got home. I then set up a, 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 a university student organization, and that then grew into an organization called Vibewire, which was about exploring how we use media to empower young people. How do we create those platforms? You know, doing really early kind of web platforms in 2000. And our first version of a virtual summit was in 2002. Wow. Trying to hold, like, we're, <laughs> you know, we're just playing around with this emerging technology and how could it be used to, to empower people and to let them share mm. their voices. Um, and so Vibewire continues on. Oh, there's the link. Thank you, Nicola. So Vibewire continues on today. I can only take a, a smidgen of credit. I mean, I was there for the first eight years. I basically gave my 20s to Vibewire. But it's now been, it's now been more than, it's now been 12 years wow. or so since I left and the organization was, is just about to turn 20, which is just kind of mind-blowing <laughs> to me. Um, not at all. <laughs> yeah. And I was like I had this other child somehow when I was at university. But it's now kind of all grown up and out in the world. <laughs> Um, so, you know, as I was saying at the beginning, and as you've referenced, you've done like some really cool things over your career. Um, so tell me, like, what are you most proud of? What's actually also not just your career, in your life as well. What, like, what makes you really proud? Um, my kids make me really proud. My wife makes me really yeah. proud. She's, she's so clever. I don't know how I managed to end up spending my life with her. Um, on a, on a more professional basis, you know, I, I think... I mean, I'm probably the most proud of Vibewire. I just think it's amazing that it's 20 years old and that yeah. I was able to create something that has managed to live on so far beyond me. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was never sure it would. You know, even the, the day I stepped away, I, I did so with an incredible amount of anxiety and nerves. Mm -hmm. And I probably stayed longer than I should have, in a way, in terms of energetically. Right. I was a bit jealous of all, all my early collaborators and so on who got to, you know, who spent two or three years in the trenches with me and then leveraged that into all sorts of cool jobs and opportunities. Right. Afterwards, you know, while I just uh, stayed there in the shed, don't worry, I'll hold it all together. Off you go, have fun, <laughs> get a little beer. Um, and so I, I did reach the point where I felt a bit, a bit stuck and stymied, and ultimately that led me to, you know, not only leave the organization but move overseas for years because I think I was so like pent up right. and I to, like change everything. But 
But to my kind of astonishment and, you know, incredible gratitude, it's it's still there 12 years later as a result mm. of, of course, the leadership and commitment of so many people mm. through the years. But but now that I, you know, I've spent the last nine years helping people launch their organizations and projects through Start Some Good. And so I certainly have an appreciation of how hard it is just to get things launched and certainly how difficult it is to make them last for any period of time, particularly mm. post the, the original founding team. So I'm incredibly proud that somehow, to my astonishment, we did kind of build something there that was that was that, that was able to last. Yeah, it's a massive, it's like a massive legacy. It's a huge achievement. Amazing. Um, so getting to things maybe maybe not so proud of. <laughs> yeah. What? Tell me about some of everyone fails at something, like I do yeah. quite regularly. Um, so can you give us maybe one or two examples of when you fail? What would you do yeah. differently? Oh, look, I've found it so many things. I mean, I think I'm, I'm just, a, you know, I'm a big trier. I just, I try, I, I'm always willing to just try lots of things. I'm willing to try them when I'm kind of under-resourced and under-prepared and don't know what I'm doing. Um, and sometimes they come together. <laughs> and, and sometimes, often, they, they don't necessarily. Um, so there's so many, so many failures to choose from in a way. One of the ones that, I, you know, that I think might be worth mentioning. So when I, when I left Firewire, Kind of picks up our story from a chronological point of view as yeah. well. Um, in 2008, I, I moved to the US and I had this slightly naive idea that I wanted to work on the presidential campaign, that America had done such a bad job of selecting their own president that they needed my wow. help. Um, <laughs> I should do. To, to, yeah, to do a better job in 2008. That proved to be impossible because I couldn't just, because I, I needed a sponsored working visa. Okay. Um, and I didn't actually have any experience with electoral politics. Like I'd, I'd been, I'd been in the get young people interested in politics and involved in politics. And I had, a, I had a smidgen of organizing experience, to be honest, from during university, but, but very little, not the kind, not, not enough experience that a, that a, a, a campaign in the U S would sponsor me, would go through the process of, you know, I could have, I could have volunteered, but that wasn't possible for me because I just worked for a small not profit I set up for the previous eight years. I had no savings mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in my normal, this is, this is kind of classically in a way, like I have a big vision, but don't really kind of plan it all through very carefully or even know entirely what's involved. I just kind of shot over there. Somehow talked my, my then girlfriend, now wife, into leaving what was her trade job at the time to go on this adventure with me. And I rocked up in, in America while she was still traveling a little bit in Europe and doing an art some internship. And I had kind of, you know, four weeks. I was going to sort stuff out. I was going to. Uh, I was going to going to get us organized, and you know, it didn't why it was you know it wasn't quite as easy. You know, there wasn't a a, a welcoming committee at the airport for me <laughs> when I arrived, saying thank God you're here. Um, and so I you know had to do a bunch of interviews, and I ultimately ended up with the perfect organization for me in Washington D.C. Ashoka, who actually invented the phrase social entrepreneurship 45 mm -hmm. years ago. Believe that. But during that period, you know, during those couple of months when when I was figuring out what I was going to do and finding work and so on, I was a bit stir crazy. Like I said, I, I just, mm. I'm not I'm not used to not having projects on the go yeah. or having devices. So I was going to conferences and learning as much as I could about digital online organizing and digital politics and so on. And I met someone anyway. I came up with this harebrained idea for a way in which I could still, I thought, contribute to the you know what was going on politically and so on. And I founded a project called Yes We Care, which mm -hmm. was about which was about articulating to Americans the interest the world had and the sense of the, the world as a stakeholder. And the fact that the world, you know, that American politics is world politics and that, that you know, that, that we are paying attention, that we do care about the outcome. And here are some of the principles that we think are really important for American leadership and stuff in the world. And I, I managed to raise a little bit of money from my contacts back in Australia. Um, and I, you know, set up this website and launched a thing called Yes, We Care. But of course, I, I hadn't actually spoken to any Americans about it. You know, it was just this idea in my, in my head. And I kind of convinced other Australians that it was a good idea. And of course, it, it didn't land very well. Because in <laughs> fact, most Americans don't care that we care. Right, yeah. Um, you know, and, and the Americans who do care that we care are already firmly in one camp. And anyone who, for the most part, anyone who's like wavering or, or, or somewhat on the other side, overtly doesn't care. Like, like is, is proud of not giving a damn. Mm. So, well, and don't you tell me what to think. And yeah. you know, there's been a few hilariously bungled efforts like this. I think it was the, it was the Guardian, the Independent, one of the British papers have their readers calling Americans in swing states that same election. To try and do like phone, <laughs> phone wow. because you know, not working at all. If you're a swing voter in Ohio, getting a phone call from some British reader of the Independent <laughs> likely to influence you. So yeah, that was that was bracing. That was that was like a real experience of like people not being like, oh, it's such a nice, you know, good effort. Really love what you're doing. You're doing it for the right reasons. People were just like, who the hell are you? Who the hell are you to tell me what what I should be doing and what you know what politics is right for my country? Um, so yeah, that was a real I think learning experience and the importance of talking to your ultimate audience um 
and speaking to your kind of intended beneficiaries or what have you because I think that kind of dynamic plays out a lot in social mm. impact, which is a bunch of well-meaning people with zero lived experience yeah the thing that they're trying to address coming up with what they think is a very clever plan to help category of person x yeah and then, you know and then rocking up and then like, we're here to help uh, here's what we're going to do uh, and not doing that listening first so I, i've since then learned a lot about the importance of listening and, and really becoming you know learning your, your audience and apprenticing yourself to the problem before you necessarily kind of plunge in with a solution yeah um, so that was one really spectacular crash and burn um that's a pretty spectacular one <laughs> so like it it comes to me that you're very like i love that you just like oh, i'm gonna go to the us and you know change the world basically <laughs> um so where does this come from like where do you have this like just such positivity and you know i'm drive basically that you're gonna be able to achieve what you set out to do you know what what is what is the motivation where do you get it from basically it's a great question and I can only credit my parents, so I often wonder what were the particular set of things that they did to, yeah. not to say that I think that I worked out perfectly, I'm more, I'm more looking at my sister, I think my sister's the more accomplished, smarter um, one of the two of us and after the parent go, how did my parents do it? <laughs> um, she's awesome, she's doing great in the world, like what they do and now that I have kids myself, I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> like, you know, I don't quite know how to reverse engineer it. I do think there are a few key factors, um, one, is, one is that my parents were very purpose driven. Mm. Um, they weren't entrepreneurs, they're both public servants, but they had a really strong sense of purpose, you know, always in, in their work. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I realised how how kind of special that is yeah. growing up. In some ways, that was just the norm for me. So I grew up with this kind of model of work in my mind, that work is how you pursue your purpose. But mm. that's, just, that's just what a career is. <laughs> a career yeah. is figuring out what impact you want to have on the world and then, and then, you know, figuring out who will pay you to do that. So my dad was a town planner. He was the, we, I grew up in Fremantle, West Australia, and he was the head town planner there, and he's since been the Sydney Harbour manager and worked as an academic and oh. um, gone back to WA as the West Australian Planning Commissioner. And he's deeply passionate about the role that, that planning plays in people's lives, you know, how you build connected, vibrant, sustainable communities through good planning. And my mother worked for the ABC almost my whole life. Um, right. Incredibly passionate about the role of a public broadcaster in a democracy and the role it plays. And she was a real pioneer with feminist programming and um, and, and setting up rural stations in WA. You know, people who once again like really focused on, I guess, including excluded voices. So mm -hmm. I just kind of grew up with that as my kind of mental model of what work looked like. And I think partly that was why I felt so lost midway through high school because absent a, a kind of cause or a sense of purpose, I didn't kind of. I, that's why I really didn't know what I was doing. I didn't have a sense of just work as like a thing you did because you had to pay the rent. And then you find your passion and your, you know, your joy on the weekends or whatever. Um, and so, and so absent that, that sense of purpose, I, I didn't have a model of, of a job as, as something you just had to get on with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's why I'm always really impressed. I, I feel like, like I, I work really hard. I'm really purpose driven, but the couple of times I've tried to sell out, I'm really, really hopeless. I've, 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 been, I've been fired from a bunch of jobs because if the job doesn't fully engage me and doesn't really activate my sense of purpose, I, almost, I very quickly end up starting something else on the side and that thing often then takes over, overtly starts to impact my, my focus and attention to work and, and then I get fired. And that's happened in the early stages of Firewire, starts from good, like almost always that's the, that's the cycle for me. So I'm, I kind of feel like, you know, there's been times where I just wanted to have a well-paid, mm. less challenging, less all-encompassing job and, and just have fun. And there's a few moments where I had that and I can see it, but. I, I think I'm just drawn to just starting up things that matter. And, and the other thing I, I, I would have maybe touched on is that they, in addition to being purposeful, they were, they were also political. Um, and they weren't yeah. you know, actively involved in politics, but we talked about politics a lot. My uncle was in politics. Um, um, I had a funny experience, actually. My uncle was, the, was John Dawkins, who was the Federal mm -hmm. Minister of Education, who ended free tertiary education in Australia, mm -hmm. um, brought in the HEX wow. program. And I, I, I went to quite a few rallies when I was... 17 and 18 against uh, education funding cuts. And wow. I, was once, I was once at a rally in Sydney with, I don't know, 10,000 people, I want to say, all of them chanting down with Dawkins. Quite a surreal experience <laughs> when that's your it name really as well. Is. Well, you know, meeting people, like, what's your name, Tom? Tom, what? Oh, never mind. <laughs> I just go by Tom. <laughs> wow, that would have been weird. <laughs> but that did get us, you know, they were big on, we were, as, from as young as I can remember, we would watch the 7 o'clock news and then we'd yeah. go down to dinner and we'd talk about what we'd just seen on the news. And so it was just kind of, that was just dinner table conversation. And, yeah. and so I think that's why I did end up, ultimately that was what helped me, I guess, get selected because I could I could talk about issues. Yeah. I, I'd yeah. grown up arguing with my parents a lot about, but about esoteric things like whether Zimbabwe should confiscate 
the land from white farmers and redistribute it. I remember a furious argument with my dad about that when I was How like, old were you at that time? Um, like 15 or something, you know, kind oh. of arguing with my, my parents about politics with our family culture. Yeah. Um, and so I hadn't done anything because I hadn't figured out how to be active. I hadn't figured out how to kind of take steps towards doing more than just arguing. Um, mm-hmm. But it did mean that when I had that opportunity where someone was like, what do you think about the world? I'm like, I'll tell you what I think about the world. Um, and so I was very, you know, I, I am, I think, classically privileged that I was brought up in a family and, you know, as a, I think a, a white male um, to believe that my voice mattered from a very early age, my parents telling me that my voice mattered, my parents encouraging to, me to express myself even on things that I had no basis of knowledge in really, but, but been willing to, you know, been willing to articulate, to have a firmly held opinion, <laughs> even yeah. with very lightly held facts uh, yeah. and knowledge and experience. And, and I think that that's what allowed me to, I guess, flourish and take advantage of some of the kind of youth empowerment type opportunities that were out there, because they're really designed for people like me. Yeah. Um, but I've but I've tried to, as I've become aware of that dynamic, I guess I've really tried to use that privilege to to then expand it out, and to mm-hmm. and to try and build you know more opportunities for people not exactly like me, of mm-hmm. all different sorts, to engage in ways that don't necessarily involve rocking up to a bunch of strangers and willing to grab a microphone and spout off about things that we need to do. Of course, a lot of different ways to share our stories and participate. Absolutely. Um, we're going to open it up to questions from our attendees soon, but I just have another. It's actually related to what you've been talking about. So your parents were obviously very influential. So maybe later on in your career or even from the early days, did you have other people that influenced you or mentored you? Somewhat. I'm actually, I'm really bad at cultivating mentors and I'm not very good at asking for advice and help to be honest like I am also like terrible as part of I think what's also pushed me in a direction of starting my own things a lot is that I, mm-hmm. I think I, I'm I, I'm not great at taking direction okay <laughs> from my, my parents my teachers yeah. uh, from people so I have I, I've never I've never recruited a mentor or had a kind of formal relationship with anyone who I would feel comfortable in front of them at least saying this is my mentor yeah. Um, but I have been fortunate that over time I have really benefited from, you know, I would, you know, through, throughout my 20s I was going to conferences and speaking at events and so often being the youngest person in the room or on a board. And I, I did get to meet mm-hmm. a bunch of people who were a bit further along in their career and some of them really stuck as, as friends and allies. Yeah. Um, and so I, I do have a handful of people that I've been checking in with, you know, for yeah. 15 plus years now and having, you know, several coffees a year. And <laughs> they're the near, they're, they're certainly the closest thing I have to mentor, but I, I sort of know if I don't want to uh, address them, you know, label them that in front of them. But, but that has, you know, that's been important to me, but it's also something I know that I have not done well and could have done a lot better over time um, is, is cultivating uh, more advice and feedback yeah. and, and, and probably been better at that. Interesting. Um, so if anyone has any questions, Nick's going to help us facilitate um, the Q&A. But maybe if people, we do have a couple of questions, but I'll give people a bit more time. And I have one more question for you. Um, so outside of work, no work, like, no, I'm sure you work like seven days a week. I'm sure you're always thinking about work. Um, what are you passionate about in life that is not work related? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm passionate about travel, music, and and nature and outdoor yep. experiences. You know, those things often go together. Yeah. Um, so kind of going, you know, I've always, I mean, I don't get out as much now. Well, no one gets out right now. No. <laughs> but no, music's always been a really big part of my life culturally. I, I ran a, you know, alongside the same time as well. But during my at university, I set up a, a dance music production company that I ran for a few years and put on probably okay. a couple of hundred events. Wow. Um, over these years from, from kind of every second Friday night events in this, at, at, if anyone knows Loud, Lounge Cafe Bar. Yeah. Still, still open. That. Yeah. Yeah, man. I ran, uh, I ran a night there every second Friday night for four and a half years called Zero Kelvin because it was chill music. No. Um, it's really fun, but also quite big, quite big five stage festivals with, you know, 1500 people or so on. Um, and, but also just going to events and festivals and being part of that. I um, have been to Burning Man a bunch of times. My wife and I set up a theme camp there that continues to this day um, without us. Um, that, is, that is one of uh, one of the core theme camps in, in that festival now. So that's always been an important part of our life. And I've always really, and I think it's been an important part of how I've been able to not, like one of my great skills, I think, is not burning out. I'm a bit of a serial monogamous when it comes to projects. Right. I tend to like lock in for a decade on the thing, on, on, on the thing, you know, I did, I did kind of eight years or so with Firewire and nine and a half years into Stux and Good Now. And I think that is one of my great, 
skills. I don't know if yeah. <laughs> skill is even the right word. As an entrepreneur, is like I am. Like I think a lot yeah. of people give up two or three years in when it's hard right. and it hasn't gone the way they want. Nothing I've ever done has gone kind of according to plan. I always have fantastical ideas and and, and ambitions about how, how good it's going to go and how, how many people it's going to reach. And, and nothing has ever reached. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I can't think of a single project I've ever run that has achieved my ambitions. But I don't really let that get me down either. <laughs> yeah. I go, well, that was, that was pretty good. Let's get on with it and do the next thing. And, and, and the part of that, I, I think, is, is maybe a natural optimism um, and energy yeah. on this stuff. But I think also part of it is that I, I really kind of cultivated other spaces. And so for a long time, certainly all through my 20s, at I, I, like outdoor festivals were my other space. Yeah, right. um, that I could go to and be part of a community where I wasn't in charge and no one was looking for me for answers. I was just part of the, you know, part of the gang, part of the crew, part of the community. Um, mm -hmm. But which kind of created, you know, there's a magic to the festivals as a kind of third space, as, as, a, as a community that I was really gravitated towards. Ooh. These days, you know, it's a little less music festival and more time with kids. Um, but got a couple of kids. Yeah. Yeah, so I've got two boys now, seven yeah. and four. Nice. Who I adore, and um, I particularly adore spending time outdoors with them. Nice. So we try to get out to the bush uh, quite a bit. My parents have a have a place near oh, Lithgow right. that, that sadly got, got quite badly affected by oh. the fires in December. Um, or else it would have been a really nice place to spend time now. Um, but that's you know that, that's still my passion. I, still, I don't do as much of it as I'd like. But um, I am very fortunate that I get some of my travel by in work travel, which is you know not not the equivalent. You know, it's very glamorous until you do <laughs> until you do a bunch of it. Yeah. Um, but I, but I am but I don't want to be too first world problem with that problem about it like it has been an enormous privilege over the last few years to get to go and, and attend and speak at, at, at events in places like Addis Ababa, Ethiopia or, or I wow. did a tour of the Pacific Islands in December with UNDP um, yeah. which was amazing or to, or to get out to Scotland a couple of years ago um, so that's been wonderful I haven't really done a big a big non-work overseas trip for, for quite a while um, <laughs> we had one plan we, we worked we were going to do one in September this year oh, same. <laughs> with the whole family yeah so that's yeah. A, up in the air um, yeah. when, we'll get, when, when we'll revive that plan. Um, okay. But yeah, the other thing I, I probably just right now is, is uh, audiobooks and podcasts. I listen to a lot. Mm. My primary form of kind of, uh, I guess, content consumption. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And it's got me back into books. I kind of lost the habit of reading. I was a massive reader, but found it hard to read. I think it's like I'm reading all the time on a screen. Yeah. Like my, my whole life is emails and reports and proposals and I mean, meetings as well. But um, I feel like my eyes are tired. My brain, my brain's still good, but my eyes are maybe tired. And I haven't <laughs> the energy to kind of like yeah. focus that much. And so just be able to like almost every evening, I'll take a moment after the kids are in bed, where I'll sit out the back of our house and nice. I'll, I'll have a glass of wine more often than not, and I'll listen be, listen, listen to whatever I'm listening to at the moment. It's a really Nick nice just um, Nick just asked what your favorite podcast is. So I have an idiosyncratic kind of collection of podcasts that mostly fall into kind of one or three categories. So I listen to quite a lot of American politics podcasts. Yeah. I found it really hard to detach. It's actually, this is kind of an, an attention struggle in my life. A little bit has been been less consumed by American politics. Mm -hmm. It's so crazy. It's so hard to look away. And it's it's honestly taken up an absurd amount of my bandwidth, just my mental bandwidth right. and my, my media consumption over yeah. ever, since, ever since I've been there. I've never really... And it makes me less informed about Australian politics. It kind of like takes up too big a proportion of my total uh -huh. kind of politics and media brain. Anyway, podcasts of the main way. Uh, then... Uh, sport, primarily basketball, the NBA. I, I'm, a really, I'm, a, I'm a big NBA fan, but I never watch a game ever. I don't think I've seen an NBA game in years. I'm a really weird fan. I follow it almost entirely by listening to people talk about it, um, and then like reading reading some tweets, and then um, and then and then history. history. Um, I have a few. So in each category, uh, oh, and then entrepreneurship is probably the other one. You know, interviews yeah. with founders. So probably my favorite in entrepreneurship might be How I Built This. How I Built This. Yeah, by NPR. Okay. Yeah. My my, fa my favorite uh, for MBA is probably the Bill Simmons uh, okay. podcast. Uh, my favorite for history is probably my top two there is the Revolutions podcast. The mm -hmm. History of Rome podcast. I've, I've finished that now, but if you haven't listened to that, you're all interested in the History of Rome. That's epic and awesome and one of the all-time great history podcasts. Uh, that guy, uh, Mike Duncan, finished up with it at, at the dissolution of the Western Empire in the, fourth, in the fifth century. Um, and moved on to the Revolutions podcast, which is fantastic. It has moved with the French and the American and the Haitians, currently in the Russian Revolution. Um, but then another guy picked up where he left off with the history of Byzantium, mm -hmm. the Eastern Empire, and is now, you know, we're now another thousand years uh, on in the story there, and that's continuing. And then what was my other category again? Uh, <laughs> I, I had a fourth one. Oh, gosh, I've forgotten now. Sorry. Oh, oh, American politics, um, yeah. probably the week. Okay. For American politics, um, probably the 350 podcast. Um, sorry, three. Is it three, three, five, six? 
I have to look it up. Um, and the weeds. Okay. Now we've had everyone, I knew this would happen, which is great. People want to pick your brain about um, social entrepreneurship and we've got 10 minutes. All right. So Nick, I might just, I can see some of the questions, so I'm good to ask them. Um, so far away, everyone. Okay. We've got one here. My question is going to come across a bit clunky, but I just would like to hear your thoughts, Tom, and tips on how traditional not-for-profits can adapt a social enterprise, social impact model. I mean, anyone, I think traditional not-for-profits are actually in a great place to do that. You know? There's not, nothing that holds back a traditional not-for-profit any more than any other person in, in conceptualizing uh, a product or service that, that their community needs and, and that makes a difference. And in fact, that not-for-profit is likely to bring quite a lot of assets, including reputational credibility uh, to that work. The, the key is obviously kind of getting, getting the balance right, I think, between the business model and the impact model. Mm -hmm. So as a way of thinking about that, um, we, we have a kind of a little taxonomy of, of impact models that we can help think about the different ways you can approach this and start some good. And they're in two main buckets, which is redistributive impact models versus embedded impact models. And so redistributive business models, are, uh, impact models are, are essentially you're running a, a traditional business that is designed mm -hmm. to generate a profit or a surplus, and then you redistribute that profit or surplus. So it's not necessarily the product or service itself that makes the difference, it's the profits that are generated that makes the difference. So thank you water might be a great example of that. You know, there's like, I mean, not only is there nothing socially positive about bottled water, it's actually kind of a negative thing. Don't buy bottled water guys. We live in a country with abundant, incredible water. But, um, but you know, when, you know, when they, when they do sell those, the, the, those bottles of water, the profits they can be distributed or, or say Tom's shoes, buy one, give one for every pair of shoes sold, another pair of shoes is distributed, the same kind of thing. Using the surplus that's generated from the traditional business activities, so that's using your profits to make a difference. The other model embedded is where you, instead of making your impact through your profits, you make your profits through your impact, mm -hmm. and so the impact is driven by the business activities itself. And there's, I think, four main ways that people in, embed that impact, and it's either to do, it's usually to do with the nature of the product itself. So the product is better for the world, or better for the individual. So better for the world means it might be a circular supply chain, you're using a waste product, it's simply more sustainable than what it replaces. And that's a line that moves over time. You know, once upon a time, maybe being fair trade would have been enough to be considered a social enterprise. Now it's not social enough. Mm. Because in some ways, and that's how it should be, because we're kind of moving the norm. And I think to be a social enterprise, you need to be more social than the norm. If you're just, if you're just the norm, well, that's just kind of a market. Mm. That's just kind of a market force that you're adapting to and responding to. You're not driving that change, I think. Um, or it's the employment that's generated from that product. Um, and so that's, you know, create, you know, the, the people who get the opportunity to, to make or deliver the product or service and the jobs that are created. And that normally involves, of course, rethinking kind of the way in which employment is managed or the way in which people are recruited or the way in which they're trained to, to adapt it to, to potentially people who have less, you know, less skills or experience um, with employment. So it's, I guess, a matter of thinking about how you know what what is your mission and what are the adjacent what are the what are the things that the people you're serving need and are there ways to deliver what they need in a way that can um that, that can be sustainable in its own terms or, or partially sustainable i mean the other thing i think people get really binary and they think that it's kind of like all charity or all social enterprise driven by trade and we actually have a lot of successful social enterprises that are hybrid if you look at someone like street which is quite well known street is street 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 has significant ongoing philanthropic support you know, they, they use the, their headquarters cost them a dollar a year on a 50 year lease. And that's because that's a, that's a big philanthropic contribution mm -hmm. and write off on the property owner. And mm -hmm. that's what, but, and so there, I believe about two thirds earned revenue and one third philanthropy. And so it's, sometimes it's not possible to get to hundred percent because mm -hmm. of the investments that Trip Street have to make in helping kids who are homeless or at risk of homelessness and becoming employable. It's not like a normal cafe that can just take whoever already has the skills and put them to work. And so, but, but, but that allows them to kind of essentially pitch to philanthropists, you only have to pay for a third. Instead of right. paying for this whole yeah. ecosystem of support, you pay for a third, we'll cover two thirds. So it essentially makes them three times more efficient in the eyes of the philanthropists. They can offer kind of a three times greater ROI for the philanthropic dollar. So often where you'll fall and what you can, and this is easier when you are a not-for-profit because you have that structure. Anyone can trade, anyone can sell products and services, but only you can provide philanthropic benefits potentially or, or, or complement that with a philanthropic ask. And I think often it's the kind of combination of the two um, that can lead to the greatest success. Okay. Um, Mary has asked, or she said, 
statement and question. I agree with your perspective regarding the need to focus on the enterprise component of the social enterprise. How do you think we can help to build skills and know-how so that well-intended fledging social enterprises stay focused on the connection between dollars and cause? Yeah, it's a great question, Mary. Um, just before I plunge in, I, I, I would say that I, I think it's not, I think both are really important, obviously, and I, I think that we often have kind of a gap in both directions. The social enterprise sector is an interesting kind of space where there's lots of people who are really good at impact trying to figure out business and people who are good at business trying to figure out impact. Um, and there's there's gaps in both directions, you know, and some people have really got to figure it out and they're, all, you know, they're awesome and people we look up to admire and learn from. But there's a lot of people coming from either direction. So I, I think you also see a lot of social enterprises that work in business terms, but are not well thought through in impact terms mm. as well. Like their impact is very modest, but they make a big deal about it. Um, they're really doing something that's more traditional or, or sometimes even activities that create negative externalities that are not well factored into their impact model. Um, but I think that in both cases, you know, it's it's about helping people, I think, th think through the key steps. People don't know what they don't know. Um, and so I think, you know, th this is why I'm not trying to be too promotional or anything, but this is why we launched the Good Hustle course last year. We'd spent almost nine years helping people launch social enterprise ideas. So we, we, we you know, we, we, we kind of often with people at this really interesting moment where they go, all right, I'm ready. You know, my idea is good enough. My product is good enough. I'm going to try and like put it out there, whether that's asking for a donation or trying to sell a product. Either way, like I'm ready to present what I'm doing to the to the world and ask for their support. And often people aren't ready for one reason or another. Mm. Um, and but often it comes down to that they don't they don't know what readiness looks like. They're not clear on like what are the key pieces to being ready to like what are people listening for? What do they need? What and so we're you know we've spent nine years being with people at that moment trying to help them succeed, but you know, watching them both succeed and fail and learning a lot from what it looks like, you know, what are the what are the necessary characteristics. And so what we've now done and realizing that there's only so much we can do as the crowdfunding platform, mm. you know, we, we provide a really unusual amount of capacity building and support and coaching on our platform. Like every single campaign development on our site gets paired with a crowdfunding coach on our team. And there's a, a real interaction where we offer advice and suggestions and improvements. But we've obviously got people when they're like, you know, there's only so much they can, you know, they're, they're trying to launch. They want to launch mm. ne next week or the week after or the week after that. They don't want to rethink their whole theory yeah. change or, or, or their business model or, or what have you and so good hustle is kind of taking what we've learned there and kind of reverse engineering it that if this is the destination this is what launch really looks like what are the necessary steps that have to happen before that and how and how can we kind of bring that to the surface of your awareness to turn unknown unknowns into you know they don't have to, you don't have to go straight to known in one in one step you need to go from unknown unknown to known unknowns so then you go ah i need to really work on i don't know who i'm self i don't know who this is for yeah you know, like I, I, I get the impact model and I think I have a good product, but I haven't really thought through who the early adopter market is for that product, who are my first mm -hmm. supporters, which is often a challenge. You know, it's an interesting thing with social entrepreneurs because often their visions are so universal. You know, you look at those sustainable development goals and every one of them is a universal vision. Zero hunger, good mm -hmm. jobs for everyone. And social entrepreneurs often come at things with these strong universal visions, which are wonderful. I have a universal vision. I want every person to have the opportunity to tell their story and, and be part of a community that can create the future for itself. That's my vision. I want that for everyone. Mm -hmm. But but a, a universal vision for the future of your product and the impact you want to have is not at all the same as, as figuring out who your first supporters are. Because mm. while while your product or your your vision might be for everyone, your crowdfunding campaign never is. Your crowdfunding campaign has to kind of be for the combination of the people who are going to be excited about this and the people willing to go first. Mm. The willing to, people willing to, um, and so things like that. You know, just really helping people get clear on who they're presenting for. And I think just kind of mapping that out as a clear step. And then I think, and this is another important design principle for us in, in Good Hustle, it's not on demand. You don't work your way through it kind of on your own, mm. but going, but being, being part of a community, having peers on the journey. I know that's been really important for me. You talked about mentors earlier. I, I'm, I'm not as good as at, at mentors, but I think I'm good at building communities of peers. Mm. You know, I have a couple of, of, of kind of groups that these days, you know, entirely entirely through whatsapp um but but of other social enterprise founders i have a yeah. particular group that i that i kind of you know really rely on as an important support structure for me called social enterprise dads we're all dads who have founded social oh, enterprises right. a That's very cool. particular venn diagram <laughs> but like no one else gets us no one else knows what it's like <laughs> um and so so good hustle is a cohort based program um and so that people and there's actually a lot of peer learning built into it and, and what we often see is that those peer support groups which we set up as part of the 10-week experience continue past the program um, okay. because people have you know have, have found their tribe and want to be part yeah. of that and i think i think in general that's that's really important for helping people take 
take meaningful, meaningful steps on this journey. So kind of having a clear map. Yeah. Can't, can't get somewhere if you don't know where you go. You can't get somewhere if you don't know where you're going. And you, you also can't get there if you don't know where you are. Yeah. You know, in, in order to chart a course, you need your current location and your desired location. And, and a lot of social entrepreneurs don't, don't, don't honestly have either. They don't know exactly where they're trying to get to to be launch ready. And they don't know where they are in relation to that, to that point. Yeah. Um, and so being able to have that clear map, being able to help people kind of chart their course, um, and then helping find, you know, people finding peers um, to, to, to be with along the journey. Yeah, really that's right, it's important. Um, interesting, different question now from Chris and Nicola sort of added to it. It's around, it stemmed from your childhood and, you know, being a teenager and your teachers and school, and you were saying they sort of were not that way inclined. Um, so do you think we should be doing more to build up creative kids in schools and what do you think that could look like? Yeah, I, we definitely should be doing more. I think we are doing more than, than when I was there, to be mm. honest. I mean, I'm, I'm only just been exposed to it now as why my oldest is in year two. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, he's got ethics classes and I didn't have that, you know, as an alternative to scripture. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't have that as an option. So there's things like that I'm seeing. I'm certainly seeing, I mean, all sorts of improvements in, in how we talk about it. it, it Indigenous history. Our local high school here, which my kids are not at yet, is Camaragal High, which I think is wonderful. Um, versus in high school, I was, you know, taught about white explorers discovering the way across the Blue Mountains. Mm -hmm. and, um, but but in terms of like, yeah, entrepreneurship, I do think I hope that schools are getting better at better recognizing that entrepreneur kind of entrepreneurialism, not not necessarily as the narrow meaning of setting up companies or projects, but just being creative you know, being able to synthesize information and, and rearticulate it in new ways, kind of that entrepreneurial set of skills and approaches is increasingly important for future employment right mm -hmm. across the, the board, not just for actually like founding startups or whatever, but for even for being employable. And I think that's going to be, you know, like that's why I think, you know, emphasis on things like coding is misplaced. I think that the, the point at which we need to be teaching all our kids to code is already passed mm -hmm. um, because, because like, honestly, like the software is going to be coding itself. Yeah. Um, Pretty soon, any any type, you know, any kind of a technical skill like that, I think it's going to be harder and harder for, over time for humans to outcompete AI and robotics. Um, and what's where where can we outcompete? I think it's in you know it's in imagination, it's in it's in creativity, it's it's in human connection. Um, and so I think I, I I really hope that there is a lot more of that. I'm sure there I know there is actually because we're partnered with quite a lot of organisations that do work with high school students, organisations like. Uh, like Future Everything and mm. uh, Young Change Agents. And, yeah. Well, there's a bunch of them. 56 yeah. projects, 76 projects, the one that Taj Prabhara runs. Um, yeah. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> there's, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of them anyway around the Y Gap, you know, Young yeah. Generation Against Poverty. There's a really amazing infrastructure now. And obviously, none of that was there when I, I mean, I'd never heard the phrase social. Like, Bible had turned into a social entrepreneur before I had heard the concept of a social. Oh, so, right. Sorry, sorry. what I meant to say was social enterprise. Bible yeah. became a social enterprise before I'd ever heard about it. We invented the concept of social enterprise for ourselves. Certainly yeah. not, not, not the first by any means. But, yeah. you know, because, we, because it was really hard to get grants, there's a bunch of kids doing stuff that we'd never done before and no one had ever done before and didn't have a robust impact model and didn't have any impact measurements for, um, but had a firm belief that it was needed for our generation. It was, you know, it was challenging and was never tax deductible. So, mm -hmm. you know, 80% of uh, philanthropy not available, working in the remaining... Uh, grants that are available for incorporated not-for-profits that are not tax deductible. Um, it was hard. We had to figure out other ways of funding what we were doing, and we increasingly moved into an earned revenue model just kind of just by ex exploration and experimentation. Um, whereas now, I think that people are understanding, you know, entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship, uh, not just the high school universities. And I go back and talk at my uni, uh, UNSW, a lot, and I always have to restrain myself and be like, "You guys don't know how good you have it." <laughs> <laughs> no one was helping us with any of this stuff when I was at, at, at university. We were all, just, you know, we were the nerds. We were uncool. No one, there was no programs. There was no, whereas now there's, you know, there's, there's co-working spaces and, and, and accelerator programs and business, you know, pitch competitions and a, a bloody student-led VC fund that, in, that actually invests real money in, in early stage student projects. Amazing. So it is really amazing. So I definitely see that that has changed. I don't have. I don't have. I don't know kind of how much has changed. But I, I hope it's. I hope it's a, pro a profoundly important part of the, the, yeah. the high school curriculum is is pitching and one of the things I think I didn't get enough of is, and it's interesting because I've been listening to a lot of ancient history lately, history of Rome, history of Byzantium, and so on. But when you think about like the kind of what is the classic syllabus. Uh, you know, 2,000 years ago or whatever. Rhetoric was one of the really important parts of it, like mm -hmm. learning to argue. 
And, yeah. I, and it made me think about the fact that by the time I was in high school, that had become a niche kind of hobby. That was the debaters. Mm -hmm. um, whereas when I got to university, it turned out that being able to argue with people was in fact like a really core crucial step. I mean, I did a political science and history degree. So, you know, yeah. maybe not for everyone. But certainly in my career, and when I say arguing, I don't mean having bad arguments. You know, being able to discuss ideas, yeah. being able to like, right. yeah, being able to articulate <laughs> what I think about different things, being able to synthesize yeah. the different things that I hear and then create a unique kind of synthesis that, that, that represents what I what I care about. That's proved to be the single most important kind of skill in my entire career. Um, yeah. And I and I, ho I hope that it's, it's it's coming back as a as a as a as a core part. You know, that it should be like math, science, rhetoric. Really, <laughs> I think it's on a on a, on a should be on a similar plane. With, with those kind of yeah, I agree. students. Yeah, amazing. Um, you've got so many great things to say, Tom. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's so cliche, but we've run out of time. Um, okay. There's a couple of other questions we didn't get to, and I apologize for that. Um, yeah, very sorry, but yeah, we've run out of time. Thank you so much, Tom. I've really uh, enjoyed this interview. I've never yeah, done a live fun. interview, so it's quite interesting for me as well. Um, and as Nick said before, it is recorded and we're going to pop it up on our YouTube channel soon. But thank you Fantastic. so much, Tom. That's so great. And can I just do a really, you know, one of my real rules with social yeah. entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs of, of any type is you've got to always be pitching and always be providing people with a call to action. And, oh, yes. to and I would just love to give a final pitch for, if, for everyone who's joined us here. If you're into this whole, like, participating in interesting conversations and hearing interesting stories through Zoom, and such and, and, and such technologies. I would love to invite you to come along to our Starting Good Virtual Summit, which is, as I said, on right now. We're, we're day five of 10, and then you have a further week to get to all the content. So it's not a use it or lose it live only experience. It's all free to access. We've got 40 of the world's leading social entrepreneurs and, and impact leaders um, speaking. It's a really incredible lineup. So please check that out at www.starting.gd. Thank you, Tom. Nick's just popped it up again in the yeah, chat. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks so much, Tom. I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. And thanks Absolutely. to everyone who joined us. Thanks so much for having me. And thank you for joining me, everyone. It's great to see you. Thanks, Tom. Bye. Bye-bye.